the depths of the Civil War would occasionally attend a midday church service as a calming respite from the pressures of war. Usually when Lincoln worshipped, he would slip in late by a side door and slip out early without anyone ever noticing him. But one day, the president lingered long after other worshipers had left. And finally, his aide asked him, Mr. President, what did you think of today's sermon? Lincoln replied, I thought it was eloquent, well thought out, and powerfully delivered. Then you liked it, the aide asked. No, it failed, the president said. It did not ask of us something great. The Bible is full of greats. Great one-liners, great sermons, great prayers, yet it is very rare for the Bible to show us step-by-step -step great worship in action. And yet today we hear not just one, but two scriptures describing worship that worked. The first, from Nehemiah, occurred a century after Jewish exiles had returned from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Life had not been easy. Hostile neighbors, failed crops had worn the people down. While they had succeeded in rebuilding their temple, they knew that the new temple didn't come close to the glory of Solomon's. The temple the Babylonians had demolished when they ransacked Jerusalem. <coughs> Nehemiah, as governor, had done his best, rebuilt city walls, dealt head-on with societal ills like hunger and crooked officials, but now the task at hand was bigger than reconstructing buildings or creating infrastructure. You see, the people, the spiritual foundation of that nation, their faith had been lost. It needed to be restored. <clears throat> now, when the walls of Jerusalem had been rebuilt, a Torah scroll had been discovered. So Nehemiah asked Ezra, who traced his lineage all the way back to Moses' brother Aaron, to use the scroll and lead the people in worship in Jerusalem for the first time in a hundred years. So he did. We recognize in Ezra's worship much of what we do today. Rare in those times, but common to ours, we're told that men and women were invited to attend, that Ezra stood on a wooden platform built just for the occasion, and read from early morning to midday. Something y'all wouldn't tolerate me doing. <laughs> Still, we see in that gathering, our gathering, when Ezra opened the scripture, the people stood. When I read the gospel, you stand. They spoke, amen, amen, bowed their heads, and chose leaders. Ezra. Nehemiah, the Levites, to explain what the scripture meant. Our gospel reading shows how this pattern of communal prayer, scripture reading, and commentary was handed down to the day of Jesus and how communal worship mattered to him. Being, teaching, preaching in the temple was in his core. Today, Luke says, <laughs> Jesus returned from his baptism and temptation in the desert, powerful in the
the Spirit. That Jesus had put that Holy Spirit energy to work by teaching in synagogues across Galilee and receiving rave reviews. So naturally, when he was at home in Nazareth on the Sabbath, Jesus didn't sleep in or catch up with laundry. He went to the synagogue as was his custom, Luke says. And since those synagogues, unlike today's, frequently didn't have professional rabbis to lead them, it was up to the congregation not only to read the scripture, but interpret it as well. How do you like them apples? Can you imagine being called up to read and preach without prior warning? And who knows? What family members, what boyhood friends of Jesus were sitting in that congregation the first day Jesus, as an adult, read and preached from his hometown synagogue. What great expectations did that congregation house? Did they preen and fuss and say, here's one of our own? That handsome Jesus, Joe and Mary's boy, back home from winter break. It's good to have him back. Word on the street is he's doing well. We know just what to expect. We know what we are going to get from him. President Lincoln explained regarding that lousy sermon of long ago, it did not ask of us something great. The gift of these texts is not just details of how to do worship, but how we should respond to that worship in largesse. Nehemiah tells us all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. <coughs> when the word was heard, people wept. Why? Well, honestly, we don't know. Maybe they wept because it had been so long in Israel since anyone had heard the law. Maybe they wept because when finally the word was heard, they realized just how far they had strayed from God's ways. Maybe they wept for joy, for the joy of the Lord is their strength. Joy and rest, recognizing that while they had abandoned God, God had not abandoned them. <coughs> Maybe they wept because they found their faith. Faith in a God who would preserve them through thick and thin. But whatever Ezra read, whatever he said, it must have been great because it moved them, emotionally marked them forever. <laughs> Frederick Niebner says, choose your words carefully if you preach to the people back home. It's clear that 
Jesus got to choose what he read. That day of his inaugural sermon at his hometown synagogue, true, he was handed the scroll from the book of Isaiah, and today's translations divide Isaiah into 66 chapters, so there was a whole lot of text for him to choose from, but no one expected Jesus to choose the words he chose. Or, for that matter, to say what he said after them. He chose verses in Isaiah, a prophecy predicting the Messiah. Then told his neighbors and friends the scripture was being fulfilled in him. <laughs> His hometown thought they knew what they were getting, but they had no clue how God would choose him, use him as Messiah, as living sacrifice to transfigure and transform, and as we will hear next week, their reaction was outrage. A sudden desire to throw Jesus off the cliff. In the novel A Patchwork Planet, author Ann Tyler introduces a fictitious business called Rent a Back. The company provides young helpers with strong backs to assist more mature clients with weaker backs. At one point, rent-a-back helpers carry Christmas decorations from Maud May's attic and then trim her Christmas tree so when Maud's children arrive for a visit, they will believe she is managing just fine on her own. The older woman dresses up for that children's visit, and when she re enters the room, one of the rent a workers says, My, Maud May, you are beautiful. Maud May's a little deaf. But her face brightens and straightens up in pleasure, and she says, I do? I look useful? <laughs> no, the helper says, you look beautiful. And it's then Maud May says, oh. And her face and body sad disappointment. <laughs> Friends, I may never preach a sermon so great that masses sob at the end of worship or want to throw me off a cliff. But I will say <clears throat> thank you for trusting me to be one of your many leaders, for valuing communal worship, for knowing there are many things you can do just fine on your own, but that being a Christian isn't one of them. God chooses you. Lord, make this beautiful church more useful in your sight. And may the joy of the Lord